I hope everybody has uh, had an opportunity to um, have some dinner and have some dessert. I want to thank you all very much for coming out here tonight. And I want to thank uh, the Silicon Valley uh, Innovation Institute, and in particular Michael and Jesse, for hosting this and putting this all together, so thank you very much to them. Uh, my name is Seth Ressler. I'm your host for the evening, I guess. And um, uh, this is a topic that means a lot to me and interests me quite a bit. Um, I studied political science. Uh, I have been an entrepreneur the last several years, uh, particularly in the social media realm. Uh, and politics is just something that fascinates me. Uh, I want to thank the voters of Ohio for renewing the best reality television show there is out there last night um, because this Republican primary has fascinated me to no end. Um, and I want to uh, invite you all to come out here. Um, I think that this is a, a very important uh, topic because I think um, we are seeing a lot of changes. Uh, we're seeing changes in the way people, not only here in America but around the world, are being governed by the way we are choosing our leaders, uh, both here and around the world, and uh, even uh, in the way that people are protesting when they are not happy with their leaders. And we're going to talk about each of those subjects here tonight. Uh, I want to welcome uh, our panelists who are spread around the room. So I'm actually going to introduce each of you and uh, have you stand up and say a few words about yourself. Uh, you knew that you were speaking, right? I mean, that was, that was part of the deal. No <laughs> <That was> surprise. <laughs> surprise. <laughs> right. um, we're going to start with, uh, to my left, Dr. Nicole Velasco. Uh, she's currently an assistant professor of international relations and research methods at Lee University, uh, and she trained right here at Stanford. So, please, round of applause. Oh. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about yourself. You're making me work for my dinner, I see. <laughs> um, well, I'm delighted to be here. I am. I'm. I'm a political economist by training. My research is about public finance, so taxing and spending. Um, and I, I don't know. I, I guess I'm. I'm very. I'm very interested at, at hearing about what some of you have to think about Occupy Wall Street, the financial crisis. I guess um, if I could sum up in, in a phrase what I hope that we'll be able to address tonight is that people don't really think deeply about simple things, and that's a shame, because life happens to you if you're not, um, if you're not critically engaged in thinking macro. And, and I, hope that, I hope that we have a chance to address that, and I hope that some of the, the topics of conversation um, will help us to parse dependent variables and independent variables and, and a deeper and sort of big picture understanding of, of innovation in American politics. All right. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. To her left, I want to introduce uh, a gentleman that I was honored to go to Bellman College Preparatory with uh, down in the South Bay. Uh, his name is Peter Allen. He is a, um, a communication strategist and really is at the heart of where uh, a lot of this innovation and politics meet. So uh, you can find him on a ballot this, is it this fall? Uh, this June, actually. This June? Uh, it's, it's, it's highly partisan, so no, no, no problems with uh, Y'all are, but I'm running for a Democratic Central Committee in Santa Clara County for a second time, just as a fun way of trying to get more involved. Uh, it's really more of a crapshoot anyway. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the way that the parties elect their county representation. All the parties have a Central Committee at the county level, and it's one of those things where you try and tell someone what you're running for, and they look at you like you're uh, from some you know random country on the other side of the world. What's a Central Committee? Is that some sort of thing like from China or something? No, 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 it's not. It's, it's, it's highly American. Um, anyway. Good to see you all. I've uh, been working in communications pretty much my whole life, um, either you know paid or unpaid. Uh, studied uh, liberal arts, went to the University of Southern California for film school. Uh, got into there and realized I didn't, after a couple of years at least, didn't want to have anything to do with Hollywood. Um, so I came back to Northern California. I'm from San Jose originally. Went to school with Seth as well, as he mentioned. Um, and went through a lot of odd jobs before I really rediscovered my passion, which was for politics, and I'd had it from a really young age. Um, worked at the Mercury News for a while, uh, was an usher for the San Francisco Giants for a little while, and uh, eventually ended up on the Barack Obama presidential campaign, where I sort of saw that, comp that beautiful confluence in 2008 of the, the, the social media rise, 
um, the rise of the insurgent candidate and really a change moment in American politics, um, which happened from time to time, um, but it just happened to be the time that swept me up into it. Uh, and then when I got off of that campaign, I really wanted to focus more locally, so I've, I've gotten heavily involved as either a field organizer or campaign strategist um, in a number of city council elections, supervisor elections, uh, ballot measures, uh, even one here in Palo Alto just last year on uh, medical marijuana. Um, so. I uh, have a lot of experience with uh, the social media world. It's been my specialty as a communications consultant, and I've just started my own business this year, so I'm getting into some new exciting stuff. And I'm interested to hear what you guys all think about uh, the subject of innovation in politics, and especially how um, I'm particularly interested in how social media can work at the local level in politics. I think we're still discovering how to be best effective doing that. Um, so I'd love to hear any thoughts you guys have, any suggestions, any things you guys have noticed. And I, too, am also curious to talk about the, the ongoing reality TV show that is the Republican <laughs> primary. Because it is it's incredibly intriguing, especially um, given where we are right now. So thanks all for having me. Over here we have uh, Dr. Thomas Buckholz, uh, who actually served in the presidential administration with uh, President George H. W. Bush, uh, and has been very involved in grassroots politics. So, if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about that. Yeah, uh, thanks, Seth. I've, I've just been very lucky to have been invited into situations where, together with a lot of other people, something actually happened. In the areas of innovation and politics, the intersection, a few things. Uh, when I was 12, I came up with my father and his colleagues implemented as the Palace Verdes Estate Shoreline Preserve and locked up seven kilometers of coastline and some other parkland from future development. This was in an era in which people wanted to build boat harbors in Southern California and Pacific Coast. So that was an introduction to innovation and practical politics. Sort of phased out of uh, politics for a while, but came back in the 80s and I had the opportunity to have a lot of different parts in the role uh, in the uh, campaign that uh, led to George H.W. Bush becoming president, from early fundraising on, serving on policy recommending committees, including in innovation and entrepreneurship, flying to Washington for a two-hour meeting on a day of vacation, and my own money, of course, and a whole bunch of, of very interesting and somewhat innovative roles in that campaign, including organizing a local speakers bureau in Alameda County. Uh, in the end, uh, lots of good progress. Probably didn't contribute to the outcome of the election significantly, but that was good. Anyway, and I did wind up serving in that administration in an area that became central in innovation and governance. For example, the group that I led it in the General Services Administration while serving as a commissioner uh, came up with the idea that became the early 1990s nationwide grassroots movement to improve governmental service to the public throughout this country. The nation owes a lot to one of my assistant commissioners whose idea it was, and I got to be the federal government's highest ranking champion and spokesperson for this movement for its first three years. It was launched through the community of federal government chief information officers, of which I and a colleague in the Office of Management and Budget were the co-leaders. So that was interesting, and then I kind of dropped out of politics again, and I came back in 2000, I was a consultant to the Republican National Committee. The uh, chairman, Jim Nicholson, had this idea that there was going to be a complete change of leadership, as there is every two or four years. Only the CFO and the CIO stay, everybody else goes. So he wanted to leave a report for his successors on how to run the Republican National Committee and how to run it better. I came up. Uh, with an idea that was out of scope for the project and was not suggested by the 75 people my colleague and I, the real employee and I, interviewed, all of whom had good ideas. But it was that the Republican National Committee needed to be in a third line of business. So along with helping build uh, state party organizations and helping some candidacies, basically background work that the public might experience a few months out of every 24, my idea was winning hearts and minds and engagement of Americans, and that turned into the, under the new administration that came in in 2001, into a grassroots division, a team leader program, and a whole bunch of other things that was probably this country's first attempt by a national uh, committee 
at a grassroots effort. Uh, and uh, it probably paid off in, for the Republicans in 2002 and 2004. By 2006, it had probably dissipated to the point where it wasn't making much difference. And in 2008, the uh, campaign that you helped with uh, not only maybe learned something from this, I have rumors that it did, but it reinvented it and did it right because what the Republican National Committee did really didn't produce team leaders, even though it had 1.4 million people in it at one point. Anyway, so that's uh, some in this area. I've been very lucky to do things in other areas too, and I will pass at this point. And our final panelist to my right is uh, Josh Abend. Am I pronouncing that correct? Abend, Abend. actually. I apologize. He was trained as an architect, and he is now uh, a fierce innovation advocate. Uh, he was actually um, a colleague of the original CEF, the Creative Education Foundation, and he's been uh, a VP of product design for five divisions of a Fortune 500 company. Uh, he also headed SRI's Innovation Management Center. And uh, if you'll tell us a little bit about that. Thank Josh you, sir. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't want to use up this valuable video time in terms of the discussion we're going to have on uh, uh, innovation in American politics. I think it's really poor. I think that my background was abbreviated very well and pretty much covers the thing. I've been in the innovation field for a long time, actually since the age of 14, if you can believe it. I have my 10,000 hours in, if you know what that means, any of you who have read <coughs> Gladwell. Uh, so I, I've, I've been there, it goes back, and it was with one of the most notable designers in, in the country, actually the world at the time. Long story, I'm not going to d- dwell on that. Uh, my current passion, uh, and I've covered a lot of ground in innovation, is still innovation for what reason, I don't know, it's always fun, I, I'm a very impatient person, I like to always be uh, uh, interested in, I'm always interested in new things that are happening, but the current mission that I have here in the valley and for the country at this point, this is politics, is the development of competent chief innovation officers, managers, call, I call them architects, chief architects, people who know what they're doing and who take, can take any company, whether it's a piece of parlor or General Motors, which I worked for, by the way, at one time, and bring it forward, know how to do it, know the models, know the rules, know the, the measurement aspects. And so we have to do that, and we have to do it quickly. And to my mind, that is the key. We talk about innovation in every aspect, how important it is, what we do, and all that sort of stuff. But innovation leadership at this point, someone at that level in each organization that can make that happen is really significant. So we have to kind of get rolling. That's my mission from here to the time I leave the planet, as far as, which I hope will not be soon, but I got to get that part accomplished. So anyhow, thank you so much for inviting me. So here's what we're going to do. Um, I've already witnessed one company being formed during the course of this dinner, and hopefully there will be many more tonight. Uh, I actually want to mix it up a little bit so that everybody gets a chance to talk to uh, some new people. So what I want to do is have um, these three panelists stay where they are. Josh, will have you actually go over to this table. And then everybody else, find a new seat. Sit next to some, some new people. Uh, and then we'll introduce our first topic for the evening. So take a couple moments, switch seats, and so we're going to panel space you're going to shift. No, the okay. three, these three panelists stay with So we'll start with governing. Uh, and I'll throw out a thought there. Um, and this is uh, th- that there's a word that's always fascinated me, which is the word compromise, uh, which means two different things, depending on how you're looking at it. Uh, on one hand, um, compromise means to come together. Uh, and each side gives a little, and they come to an agreement. Uh, but there's another meaning uh, here in America for compromise, which also means to compromise your beliefs, uh, which very much means to give up ground that perhaps uh, shouldn't be given up. Uh, and it strikes me that we have hit a, a point in um, our American political system where um, everybody's concerned with one definition of the word compromise, the latter, uh, and not the first. Uh, that coming together and everybody sort of gives and, and we meet in the middle. Uh, so I wanted to offer that thought and um, pass it around the room and, and ask, you know, what sort of innovations uh, have we seen in um, in American governance and, and other governance around the world that, that has particularly struck you? And we'll start with, with Josh. 
Well, it just so happens that uh, uh, actually I'm not a particularly good expert on that. I've had I brought some other thoughts in, but I'll save them as we go along. I had another agenda I didn't tell you about. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, and but feel, feel free to go off topic. Okay. Uh, well, um, I wanted to acquaint you. This is a kind of, with what I think was an incredible innovation done by a guy called David Shrunk. I, I can't. Don't ask me about the name, but it. Um, he's a, doc, a, a medical doctor, and he's also involved in some of the stuff that we've done on the space programs and that that sort of thing. And David Shrunk, who lives in um, somewhere in La Jolla, I guess it is. Uh, is writing a book that will be published fairly soon, I think. I'm not sure which publisher, maybe Elsevier. And he's speaking next week at the uh, Science Engineering Conference somewhere in Dallas, I guess. And he calls it um, the science of laws. The science of laws. And what he suggested was really an outlandish, innovative uh, aspect that has a direct uh, link to, to politics. And essentially, he says, um, uh, basically, if I, I'm just going to take a couple of sentences, if you don't mind me reading this, as uh, um, he talks about the traditional method of making laws is seriously flawed and incapable of creating laws that effectively solve societal problems. In response to problems that are not solved by existing laws, legislative assemblies enact more laws and then add them to the existing body of laws and the result of the process is that the bodies of laws grow in size, cost, and complexity by societal problems remaining uh, unsolved and governments are thus unable to satisfy their public benefit. And basically says we are to have a scientific way of doing this like we do anything else. So he's, he says call it a science of laws. And for example his major criticism is when it comes to laws and when it comes to legislators, he says, um, uh, what we do now is uh, we do not require societal problems to be defined. We do not assign priorities to problems or solutions. We do not set goals in laws in terms of measurable outcomes. And he's very big on that. Was this gonna, does this really work and how did it work? Um, we do not require that law designers have any kind of expertise in law design or design or anything else for that matter. Uh, we do not require modeling or computer simulation of law designs. It does not require a full accounting of the costs of laws. It does not require a full accounting of the risk and side effects of laws. It tolerates design defects and intentional vagueness in laws, and it tolerates the inclusion of pork barrel and special interest provisions in laws. Now, this is a guy that came, he's not an innovator, just came out of left field, and he says, there's got to be a better way of looking at things. I think that's an incredibly great idea. And by the way, uh, I have his paper, which is going to be published. If anybody wants to do that, I would be happy to either make a copy or give you the uh, the link online, and you can read it for yourself. It's very it's very impressive. Or you can wait for the book to come out in about six, five or six months or something like that. So I was uh, I, uh, I will not go into my own other agenda. Maybe that will come around properly. But uh, I thought I'd introduce that as some, as as a new innovation that I don't think you guys have heard lately because it's really quite unusual to come at, and it's it's it to me it so per perfectly fits the agenda of this program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fascinating. Pass it to no, let's go. I think that it's better to do a two finger off of you than to <laughs> go off onto my what is democracy? Free, fair and competitive elections kind of idea that I was first thinking about. You know, I'm reminded of this, this man, his name is Avner Greif. Has, has, have any of you ever heard of Avner? On his last book, there were four Nobel laureates that commented on the back saying, this guy's good. This guy's it. This guy's the next, the next Nobel laureate in economics. And Avner's point is the way that we are effective is by simplifying. And that's sort of what you're talking about right now. Quantifying, measuring, 
but more simplifying. You know, the problem as you framed it was there's convolutedness that's happening. There's there's sort of pork barrel. All of this conversation is leading to something way suboptimal. It's about your compromise idea. And this is going to sound odd, but Avner talks about these people called the Maghribi traders of the 11th century. They were ethnically Jewish, and they uh, had this incredibly effective and efficient trading system all around the Middle East. They were amazing. They were better at achieving economic efficiency and outcomes that were good than we are today based off of norms, rules, and procedures that constrained their behavior that weren't necessarily codified, but were just understood. And it seems that that's what we need. We don't need some really, really complicated, convoluted, we don't know the specifics of something. Instead, we need some kind of consensus, some simplify. Simplify, observe, measure, and quantify, but mostly simplify so we understand these norms, rules, and procedures that are that are limiting our choices. So, Avner Greif and the Magrebi Traders, that's... Uh, that's what I got. So, just going off the question <laughs> of what you were saying, the McGreevy traders? Yes, of the 11th century. Yeah. So it sounds like they're successful because they had a code of honor. But the problem is, nowadays, nobody agrees what the code of honor is, so how do you actually like get to that point where you can simplify things? Hmm. I, I'm going to... Uh... I'm going to give up the floor really quickly because I am the least qualified person on this panel. But <laughs> before I do that, um, there is a unifying principle that we do care about. We are committed to individual thriving. There are different methods by which to achieve this individual thriving. But that's, that's the goal, right? There are guiding principles that we adhere to as Americans. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that, that comes to mind. And um, these just need to be sort of emphasized a little more to simplify, I think. All of this bickering is suboptimal. That's all I'm trying to say. I should, I should pass it along. Well, but you were on, I think you were on the right, uh, right track there. Um, in terms of coming, yeah, coming to the agreements, it's funny that you bring up the, the Declaration of Independence because even then, that depending on you know which perspective you're coming from, there are different interpretations of what life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness means. You know, I do think it's a really good point to remember, and I, we, we had a brief discussion about sort of the polarization that um, exists even locally and everywhere, I think, right now, politically in the world, <clears throat> that seems, it would seem to be getting a lot worse um, as, things, as things go on. And I think it's important to remember that your point that we were all basically individualists, you know, as, as Americans especially, the word liberal, from my perspective, has gotten completely misappropriated as this, not even as a bad name for lefties, really, we're all liberals. When you look at the definition of liberal in the dictionary, it's about individualism, it's about um, free markets, it's about uh, everything that Republicans and Democrats stand for. So really, that's a, that's a word that can define, I think, all of us. So I think it's really important for us to remember that and not to make it so much a, a one side or the other. Um, and the same thing goes for conservative, too. I think there's a conservative in all of us. There's a conservative in me. You know, I'm, I am a progressive Democrat, but I'm also very, I'm fiscally conservative. That's one of my uh, uh, staunchest beliefs, you know, is, is the belief in being uh, fiscally conservative. Um, as far as getting back to the question about innovation and how we govern, I think there's a dichotomy right now out there. Um, the you know the candidate I worked for, who's now president, has done a lot in terms of providing access to government. Right. So there's a website for every uh, every department of government, every sub department. They all have their own Twitter feed. They all have their own Facebook page. Um, making it very making government very personal. Right. Personable. Yeah, there's even a web there's even a website wethepeople.gov where you can go and start a petition that will then get forwarded to the White House for them to possibly consider. So there's all these ways, and then at the local level, you've got governments putting their meetings up online, uh, video, live video streaming. You can download the agenda and the minutes you know, in, in an instant. Um, so you don't actually even have to be in the halls of government to participate, or at least to watch. The problem from my perspective is that the, or the dichotomy exists in that we're providing all of this access and all this information, but we're not explaining what the information means. We're not really educating the people that we're hoping to reach with this openness so that they really can't even understand how it works and what, what they should be doing with all this information. And two, we're not, when people do actually feed back through these loops, from my perspective, we're not listening to them enough. You know, we're not. For, and a prime example of that, going back to a subject that I'm personally familiar with, not necessarily sympathetic with, but um, 
when We the People was started, the number one petition, the most popular petition on there, as might be understandable, was legalizing marijuana. It was above and beyond, you know, far and away the, the most popular petition. Hundreds of thousands and millions of signatures on this thing. And yet, at the same time that was happening, the Obama administration and the DOJ was reversing its policy in a way and cracking down even more on medicinal marijuana facilities and state and state mar- medical uh, marijuana rights. So there's a dichotomy there where we've got all this access and yet we're not listening to the people that are that are, act, that are actively trying to change things and trying to put forth ideas and innovative ideas. The, the innovative ideas you talked about, um, Josh, you know, we're not we're not going to listen to that. The, the, the halls of government they, they have the way that they do things and they've done things forever and a day, you know. We've, we've governed ourselves, at least in America, the same way, pretty much, all this time. It's just changed how we actually present it. Um, and in terms of the money that's involved in politics, which we could definitely go into, it really just hasn't changed a lot. And yet there's a lot of lip service being paid to the fact that it has and that there is more openness out can, there. Can I ask, and a bit of the Dr. Buckley here, um, I'm hearing two different things. One which says there may be a, a, some new ways to do this that are more scientific and more uh, mathematically modeled and, and computer modeled. And I'm hearing another idea which is that there may be new ways to do this that allow more participation from everybody and allow government to be more open. Um, are those two things opposed to each other? If you're asking me, I don't think so at all. I, th- I think there's a lot to be said for getting elected officials who make who are the final arbiters of decisions who are specialized in either a field or interesting governance and know what they're doing. You know, they don't have to be in a, they don't have to be a graduate in any specific subject. You don't have to have XYZ degrees, but you do have to have some sort of experience or expertise or a just basic knowledge, you know, whether it's a, I don't want to put our electives through a test, but really if it has to be like, you know, we have to you have to take a GRE to get into grad school, you have to take the LSAT to go to law school. Why don't you have to take a test to be an elected official, you know, or uh, at every level? And yet, I think that those, even the smartest individuals, the people that have all the knowledge in the field, benefit from a wide variety of perspectives. And I've never seen, or it's rare that you see a situation where you're not going to benefit from a wide variety of perspectives. Even if you don't, even if there's some folks you're just not going to agree with, or you're polar, polar, uh, polar opposite, or they have bad ideas. Even bad ideas can sometimes germinate good ideas. So I think, it, I think it's, they can work both ways. Dr. Buckles? I'd like to, well, my answer to your question there was, well, I'd like to go back to Nikki's point, actually, about simplicity. I took my shot at, or one shot at that uh, around 2000, trying to convince a business group that produced public policy recommendations for potential implementation over the next two to five years, maybe, uh, to have an agenda. The president of the group relabeled my proposal, simplifying the rules of American society. So I'm right with you on that, based on uh, his recommendation for what to call it. Uh, I think this is simple, uh, is would be important. Simplicity and clarity would help tremendously. Uh, thinking better, uh, thinking about the agendas we want to have and be talking about and do something about would help tremendously. On the other hand, uh, a negative here is that there are so many things like this where it is has been traditionally over the last 50 years or more very difficult to build a constituency that can take it anywhere. And so I would be curious, I know part of the agenda here is to try to throw this open for discussion as to people's thoughts about how uh, with whatever developments you see or can foresee that constituencies that today aren't able to surface Uh, potentially good ideas, sometimes not so good ideas, can actually get somewhere in getting those ideas into a marketplace for our society to evaluate. If you don't mind, I... Yeah, anybody? If I could, as a panelist, I don't want to jump in on everyone else, but there was one uh, great idea I heard recently, which was uh, applying the, uh, the VC model to innovation in politics or to in, uh, innovative ways to of engaging citizens and of uh, coming to, uh, of opening up government, things like that, where you have folks, instead of contributing to, you know, a just amorphous cause, they put money into it, oh, they do good things, I have no idea what I'm actually putting my money into, but it's a good thing. Instead, you could invest, you know, part of that money, you could choose choose different uh, startups or different uh, political startups to inv- uh, invest that money in and be sort of a shareholder in a group that does angel investing in that way. Uh, so. One, one idea for how to get more attention to it, at least. Because usually it comes down to money is the problem, is that m- money does make the world go round still, to some extent, unfortunately. The, the simplest thing is the, is the buck. 
Um, the field that I'm in, the complexity is, is the only way to solve it. So when you start to do metrics, because I'm really involved in, in fixing healthcare, and metrics are such an important piece of that. How do we know that patients are actually getting better? You know, that, that's hardly, hardly on the radar screen, and, or hasn't been for a long time. It's starting to be um, only in the last few years. And when you come up with, I've been part of organizations that try to say, OK, we've we got to keep it simple. You know, we're just going to track five metrics. We're just going to see if that's going to work. And the best analogy is pushing on a balloon. You push on the balloon in five places, and you can make those five metrics look great. But you're just pushing the problems are just going into other things, and you start to manipulate the, the metrics. And it's only when you have enough data to represent the problem in a viable way that you can tell whether you're actually making a difference. The simplicity is key in the communication. You need to be able to communicate, and that's why you know the Republican framing has been so successful on, on so many of these points, um, where you know tax relief. Who doesn't like the way that's framed? It's like, oh, of course we all want tax relief. So the simplicity needs to come from the communication. But I think when you actually get down to the laws, it's if you oversimplify, you're in big trouble. Is this an observer effect? I mean, is this you know the it's the unintended consequences effect of, of, of people sort of taking the test the way the teacher grades when yeah, they're exactly. Exactly. I, I mean, exactly. because people, you know, my mom's a teacher, my sister's a teacher, people talk about this in terms of no child left behind as well and, and other sort of government programs. I'd just be curious, I don't want to push too far into this and maybe nobody else is interested, but since you are evaluating healthcare metrics, I would just be curious to what extent those metrics are actually about health or wellness, either medical or financial, as opposed to the outcomes of healthcare interventions? Um, there, there actually is some, um, is really a movement towards the, the term is called disease management where you actually can see, is this person's quality of life improved? Um, and the first way to measure that is how, might, how many times um, you'd be surprised that one of the most important measurements is how long before a patient is back in the hospital. Because if they're back in less than 30 days, you didn't fix it. It was, it was, it's pretty much a failure. Um, and so those, that, that's something that you can actually, hey, that's a wellness factor. If we can keep them out of the hospital for a longer period of time, then chances are we actually did the right thing when they were there. And so there are metrics that really do start to measure wellness. Um, but it's, you have to look at it holistically, and you cannot, you could not have designed a worse system in terms of paying for services is the absolutely wrong thing to do in healthcare. You need to pay for wellness. We have to get to that point someday. Does that kind of help? No. Is this an argument in favor of or against this idea of laws being scientifically modeled? And um, it's, it's an argument in favor of expertise in, in, in the profession of politics. To think that a soccer mom is the right person to be making your decisions, and I'm so I'm showing my liberalness, you know. But as opposed to someone, you know, okay, so Carter or or Obama or Clinton, these folks really cared about the details of governing, maybe too much, so that they could no longer simplify and they could no longer communicate it in a simple enough way, so it was a failure in Carter's case. But I think that you need that expertise to do those laws, and then you also need the expertise to communicate about it. I don't know if that. I, I think that's really important. I think that's a really important point is that it is it's sausage making. You know, governance is dirty, filthy, complicated. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have oftentimes what we're finding, what Obama and uh, Organizing for America are finding in trying to organize outside. I think what, what you were trying to do a little bit uh, was outside organizing outside of the election cycle and trying to organize a consistent, long-term grassroots base. They're realizing that that it's it's really obtuse. There's no deadlines to point to. You can't say this is our election day because that vote could be moved, and suddenly you've got you know the deadline is now a week away or it's a week earlier. Um, so it's it's imperative that we get folks not only who know what they're doing in terms of writing law, 
but then folks who are specialized in how do we how do we make it simplified for folks? Because it is it is complicated stuff when you're talking about governing 300 million people. You know, it's not easy with 50 states with their own laws. Um, anyway, so sorry to cut in. Uh, I think there's a, a few things that are being conflated here, um, and so I want to parse them. Uh, I don't think anybody was arguing for simplified metrics. No. Metrics should be outcome-based. Does this work? Does this not work? Not, here are five different pressure points on a balloon. Um, the concept that I was trying to push back against was this idea that there's pork barrel politics that are shaping law. It's all of this discourse that's leading to this stapled together kind of a law where you have two disparate things or five disparate things or 17 disparate things being couched under one umbrella of a policy. And, and that's inefficient and not good. That, that's, that's ineffective and that simplification as applied to that concept is a good thing. Simplification is applied to, to metrics, not good. No, 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 metrics should be, does this work, does this not work? Um, and so I just wanted to make sure that, you know, we were talking about the same thing. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be comparing apples and oranges here. Yeah. Wanna, you know. The holistic metric, metric is really value, valuable. Like, so despite all those little metrics, there was the one big picture, which you apply to in my world. It's, are the patients really doing better? And if you, everything, if you can align everybody on the big picture, you can simplify that and you have a vision that you can share. So yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I, I want to also shift this to not only how we make the laws, but how we select the people who make the laws. Because I'm starting to hear this, um, what I guess I would describe as, as sort of a, a technocrat, or we need experts in the topic to make those particular laws. Um, which is very interesting, and on, yet on the other hand, we have this um, sort of participation that we value as well, which inevitably means that people who are not experts are going to at least somehow be involved in the process, and how do you balance those two things? Um, and, and I want to bring in an idea that um, I actually, I think it was when I was out at Occupy Wall Street that I heard this idea that, you know, we always talk about the fact that we're a democracy, um, but we're not a strict democracy. We're, we're a Republican democracy, which means that we all vote on our representatives, and then they go make the laws. If we were a strict democracy, we just, here's a law, everybody vote, and it gets a yay or nay. Um, we became a Republican democracy, you know, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not a historian here, but it would seem to me out of necessity. It just wasn't possible. Um, has technology made it possible? I mean, Theoretically, using the internet, we could all vote straight up or down on every single law, you know. And is that a good idea or a bad idea? Because, you know, participation versus expertise, um, you know. And what would that mean? And so I want to throw that idea around the room. Well, you picked the wrong guy. <laughs> I have to violate my oath of uh, being invited here to a certain extent, re realizing it was going to revolve around uh, innovation in American politics. And I'm going, what innovation are we talking about? Okay. <laughs> innovation? And the reason is, and uh, I'm going to read from some notes I sort of put together so I, uh, with my, my uh, memory, like a sieve, I would uh, be able to re refer to them. And that is this, in the limited time that we have here, uh, what I hear is a lot of stuff about innovation and politics and government and, and even the science of laws and stuff, which, which is, uh, I think, admirable, an interesting direction. Um, but, uh, and metrics and healthcare and all the rest of it. I get the impression in the limited time that we have here, we're going to be like trying to boil the ocean. And I'm a little concerned about that. And I would like to introduce a topic that I think has a lot of political zap to it, especially here at the dead center of entrepreneurship and all, uh, all of the businesses that have started here, the VCs and so on and so forth. And that is, I would like to move that political stuff closer to where we are in terms of uh, politics, I'd like to know what um, Washington and, and our officials, elected officials, think about innovation. And frankly, I don't think 
they think about it a lot. Not only that, I don't think they know a lot about it. A couple of years ago, this very organization had a very dedicated program to get a message to Washington. I don't know if any of you are acquainted with that. And it was, I don't know where it ended up, but from my point of view, I don't think anybody heard anyone. I even went so far as to attempt to chat up some of our local legislators and officials here in Washington. And guess what that resulted in? They didn't get it. And so I'm saying, wait a minute. Um, what, what's their impression? Well, their impression about innovation is, well, I'll give you some ideas. If you scratch them and say, tell us about, what do you think about innovation? Well, it's sort of like brainstorming, I guess, and then you put teams together. And then, um, or if you don't have that, I guess you can use crowdsourcing, get ideas, and you take that and you convert that somehow into a, uh, into a business. And if you're entrepreneurial, uh, you just come up with a good idea, and then you go to venture capitalists, and they give you money, and you develop it, and then you all become millionaires. <laughs> and Steve Jobs was the greatest in innovator and it's unfortunate that he died because there's no one else around to take his place. And I'm again, wait a minute, can we straighten this out? Right here, this is quite parochial. This is our own backyard. We can't even get our political message out. Well, I find that really, you know, that, that, that is really uh, disturbing because uh, we have a long way to go. And if you look at it, what I discovered was if you go to our Congress, we have... Uh, uh, from from my, my recent count, we have like 16 or 17 uh, committees in the Congress, and I'm not happy with where our current representatives are at, in, at those committees. Home care, a home security, budget, energy and commerce, education, workforce, armed services, natural, I mean, I could, you know, uh, space, Right? Uh, science, space, and technology, that's all one lump. Veterans Affairs, I could go on. It's about 17 of them, judiciary. And I'm thinking, gee, is innovation in there somewhere? Is somebody look? I mean, right now, it seems to me uh, that we're all we're hearing every day about our competition elsewhere in the East. Uh, isn't that something that is really important? Is there some kind of a committee that one of our representatives is working on for us? And I know who they are, and I want to tell you, I don't think so. So how can we focus that in the limited time that we have? And I realize, not to demean any of these other directions, but I'm saying, you know, I see the politics very close and very personal because it happens here in the valley. We're going to lose the valley unless we can figure this out and unless we can get our governments to say, well, yeah, uh, you know, we, we, we'll get oversight uh, on that and we can make that happen. My recommendations, I have some steps here. There should be congressional oversight on the whole business of, of, of innovation for America. Uh, by the way, formerly called Yankee Engineering or Yankee New Know How. I don't know if you remember that term. It goes back a long way. There should be a clear performance of our quanti of our innovation performance. Somebody should know. Are we doing okay? Not the kind of stuff that I get from when I e CEOs, as I've mentioned before. You know, how you doing? Oh, we're doing. Yeah, we know innovation. And I discover that it's really zip. The third thing I'd like to see is a more uh, directed uh, way for assisting entrepreneurs by providing them, uh, having a more enlightened system. Because right now, for the most part, the model is the same. Entrepreneurs get ideas and they go around begging, you know, and crawling and whatever they have to do to get funds from VCs. For the most part, that seems to be the model. There's got to be a better model than that because there's only a very limited number of folks that are going to get it, that, that model. You know that. So what happens to the rest? They, that just goes to waste. Okay? It dies. It fails. Uh, and then I would indicate also I'd like to see some mandatory 
contractual arrangements made by the government every time it gives out a contract, whether military or defense or whatever, or help, that in addition to that contract, they have a certain percentage of that that has to go into the engagement of innovation in terms of experts, systems, applications, consultants, whatever, so that somebody knows that that's happening. And by the way, that's a requirement mostly in military with respect to human factors and human factors engineering and ergonomics. You don't build a submarine or anything that an 18-year-old is going to be into without understanding what the requirements are for their capability of running that piece of equipment. So that's built into the system. Why isn't innovation built into our system? And finally, I would say that it would be great as in terms of education, I would put this forward as a challenge to folks that are professionals in the communication business and say, could we have a video, you know, maybe just 20 minutes or maybe something that goes on somewhere at midnight or anywhere that is addressed primarily to our politicians, our legislators, our senators, and say, hey, this is what we think innovation is. This is what it looks like. We're going to get rid of all of the nonsense and the garbage, and this is just by way of telling you really quickly. So they get an understanding, because we can't talk to each one of them. We can't have lunch with each one of them personally. Uh, so those, those are some elementary steps. I, again, apologize for introducing this now <laughs> into this area, but it is political, and it's, uh, you know, it's the part that I'm bringing to the party I wanted it to, so let's take this to look at. To the right here, to, to Dr. Yeah, Buckholz. Uh, there are points that you made that I might want to reinforce, but I'm going to take the other side on a few <laughs> things here. First of all, I think that uh, we are really missing in society uh, and this is something individuals can do and maybe government will follow, rethinking the society that we want to have from global to national to individual, probably in the other order, uh, individual first, but that doesn't matter. We can get through that. We could have some meaningful discussion. And we could try to position within that then what are the expectations and roles for government. And I would just, uh, skipping a whole bunch of intermediate steps, put in some hands-on perspective because part of the job I had actually was to be in charge of the federal regulations that govern 3% of the demand side of the world IT marketplace. Your federal government was spending 3% of the world's IT budget uh, uh, 20 years ago. And we did everything possible uh, that I could encourage or other people knew I would encourage to deregulate and not to add to the regulations. There's a tremendous culture around Washington that says procurement is broken and they're right to some degree. I mean, anything that complex has to be broken to almost anybody's perspective. Uh, there were no great ideas that came into my office. I came up with two things that actually stuck that required no changes of laws or regulations. They were practical ideas. They're still in use today. Uh, but the moment I hear something like this, I would take the, what I assume to be the reason that I never got any feedback from anybody else on anything significant, is that procurement reform equates to keep everything that you have in place and add more complexity. Uh, I will tell you in a different area that parallels what you were talking about, my boss as the administrator of the General Services Administration spent a great deal of time, at least in the staff meetings I observed, on issues related to the public building service. One of my peers was in charge of 7,000 or something federal buildings, including the things you see in San Francisco and Oakland, which were somewhere in the planning stages uh, at that time. And you have no idea how much time was spent on such issues as, you know, we have to give 1% of the money in this building to art to go in the building, and we've got this statue that's going in of a semi-nude woman bouncing a baby in her lap or something, and blah, 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 blah. I mean, this is where, when you get into this level of micromanagement, uh, your government tax dollars are going. 
I would suggest that you look to the private sector for innovation. The federal budget into R and into research innovation is approximately 1% of gross domestic product as it is. And maybe you don't want to conflate uh, procurement with forced innovation. That is a political statement, but I want to mention <laughs> well, right. I mean, you brought a fantastic point in that it's, you know, you wonder why there's no innovation. I mean, there's no, there's no money there. You know, uh, I, I remember, I believe it was the first year of the Obama administration, he increased R&D, I honestly forget which sector it was in, by, you know, 100, 150%. And it was the change was so infinitesimally small when you compared it to the price of a B two bomber that you know that you think well great you know it's it's for them for the, the scientists working in that field it's a windfall but in the greater scheme of things I mean we're really throwing it up at the problem um, and I think you're right I mean I think the private sector consistently is going to show that it's quicker um, than bureaucracy and then government in, in changing and eventually and unfortunately as recalcitrant as government can be to change and to to moving forward. Eventually, if you do it well enough, and if you get enough of a movement behind you, they're going to have to listen to you. But it really is about demand, and it's about money. It's about where are the you know who who. When we go, come back to how we elect folks, you know, the quintessential problem to me, and we I think we we spoke about it earlier, is that <laughs> it takes so much uh, money and fundraising and this this huge. Uh, structure around these campaigns just to get these folks into office. And once they're there, especially when you talk about Congress where you've got these two two year terms, they're pretty much running and raising funds and running for re-election the whole time they're there. There is very little time for them to even think about doing anything different or changing the way they do things because this is the way we've always done things and this is the way you have to do things and on and on. So to me the biggest thing we could we could do, which we're not doing, but there's folks trying to fight for it, is public financing of, of elections. If you take the money out of elections, you ought to you uh, reduce the need for the politicians to be campaigning constantly to get their jobs. They have more time to be more thoughtful and to think and to consider these things. And they also don't have, uh, when it comes to, you know, for example, health, uh, uh, moving forward in health, they don't have the tobacco companies in their ear saying, hey, I gave you $300,000 last year. Right? Yeah. It would be great. <laughs> um, that said, I think we're, you know, in California, we're in a very unique place because we've sort of had what you were talking about, Seth, before in terms of the people being able to make their own laws. We've had that since Hiram Johnson, you know, for over 100 years now. And it's really ironic, in fact, that Hiram Johnson created their, or helped to create the initiative system in California, the direct democracy system, as a means of fighting the special interests and pushing back on the railroads, which at the time were doing what uh, the health industry and the tobacco industry do now in, in state government, running it with, uh, through lobbying. And yet now, what do you have? You have an initiative system that's overrun by the special interests um, and by groups that pretty much Hiram Johnson would have, you know, was trying to fight, push back against. So, and really it's about money. It's because there's a threshold of signatures you have to get to get on the ballot and to gather 500,000, 504,000 signatures in 60 days requires a good amount of money. Um, so how do you solve that, right? And it comes back to the private sector. So something I didn't mention that I work on, I also work on in addition to my consulting work. Uh, for the last three years now, I've been working with a startup uh, locally in Silicon Valley called Vera Firma, which you might have heard of. It's been in the news a little bit. Um, but we're working on using uh, using existing electronic signature technology, like on touchscreens, for example, the thing at the grocery store, although much more refined now with the touchscreens on your iPhone, on your Droid, or your iPad, and applying that to politics, specifically in the areas of voter registration, so you can engage more people, uh, especially particularly young people, and even uh, marginalized populations like Latinos that are using these kind of devices more and more as their sole connection to the internet. So involving more people in the process, and then also in terms of the initiative process in California, allowing a more thoughtful, open, free, and cheaper way of folks signing initiatives and getting stuff on the ballot. So uh, allowing more grassroots efforts to get on the ballot. And also hopefully create a more thoughtful process where you're getting, instead of getting confronted with a really poorly written initiative in front of Target, you know, and being forced to sign because the guy says, oh, save the whales, sign here. Instead, you're at home, you get a link from a friend who you trust, you read, it, you read the full text of the initiative, and then you can decide whether or not you want to sign it or not. Um, Let me ask, is our political system fundamentally set up to preserve the status quo and, and as a result, stifle innovation? I, I think it is. In ter uh, maybe not in terms of the laws that we can read that you know talk about how how govern how laws are made the, the laws that govern how laws are made, um, but in terms of how we elect our leaders and who and how 
we put together the government, how we bring these people together and how those people are chosen, definitely I think it's the, the, full, the system is almost entirely incestuous and built to perpetuate Pika. itself long term. talk about Pika. Hmm? The federal, the, the, way that, the way that people are guaranteed public funding versus not FECA, F-E-C-A. Oh, correct. Yeah, I, I'm, see, I'm, again, it's, it's a big issue for me, but it's also not my expertise issue either. either so, um, But there are ways we could, we could get to that point where you have you know, tax dollars basically funding them and everyone gets the same amount of money. And if you don't have enough money to take out a TV ad in every major market in America, you just don't. And you don't do that. And you have to pick and choose and you have to run a, a sensible campaign. And instead of having two-year campaigns for president, we do what they do in other civilized countries. For example, you know, not that England's the most civilized I can think of, but you know, they call an election and three months later, everyone, everything's decided, and they all go back to governing. Whether or not it's a lot of this doesn't matter. They're at least they're governing, and they're not fighting for election all the time. Whereas here, you know, Barack Obama ran for president for two years, you know, and he's running now while he should be, you know, being able to do what he is supposed to do as president and be in Washington and govern, uh, and go around the world and govern, and yet he has to be out here raising mon- funds because the other guys are raising funds, and it just, it's, it is, it's, it's self-perpetuating, and I don't, you know, barring a change to that basic law about money and politics, I don't see how we can start to work on the other, on any sort of other innovation, because it's all, money is always going to come back to money if we're in a living in a capitalist society, which I have no problem with. I'm not a, com- I'm not a, you know, a communist by any means. <laughs> I'm a socialist. But, <laughs> but we're all socialists in a way, like a, a Lawrence O'Donnell says. So, so you, you two guys are, are, are telling us in one way or another that uh, nobody's listening, that the system is broken in, insofar as uh, the innovation that I presume uh, uh, many of the uh, uh, the folks around this table and in the valley at a, within a radius of 100 miles are interested in happening. And, and, and at the same time, we're, we're looking at, uh, if we're looking for competitive advantage and, and uh, economic growth and all of that, that ain't going to happen. Because the only way that can happen is if the innovation gets cranked up to a really higher level than it is right now. And uh, we have less people than they do, if I can put it that way. So uh, what's the answer? Does that mean we go back to the private sector? And who in the private sector? What uh, what groups, what constituency are going to see it to their interest to say, yeah, they're not doing anything in government. They can't do it. They can't help themselves based on the outline that you just described. And I, I, I can appreciate that. And it, it shows me that you've had a lot of experience in that area. But what then? So what, what's the question? It's, it's a pretty powerful question. I hope we get it solved in the next five minutes because I want to <laughs> I, I know where we're going. I, I don't want to cook. I don't want, I want, I'd like to make you weigh in on this as well. But to, oh, okay. to answer it, they, there are, on the contrary, actually, I'll give you one better. There are folks in government, and even locally here, uh, Congresswoman Eshoo, Congresswoman Lofgren, who do care and who do believe in the innovative spirit, and yet they have become so frustrated, even in talking to them personally, about where things are at and where uh, where things have come, and the just lack of change that they don't even see a, a road out of it anymore. You know that they don't, they can't build a big enough coalition to get those things done, and so they're listening, and they are hearing, and they are sympathetic, and yet at the same time. They have become disillusioned to the prospect yeah, of anything I'm getting done. Something I, I don't seem to find that in our local papers. That the, the very issue that you that you uh, pointed out. They why are, why isn't some why isn't some uh, uh, reporter uh, telling us this in terms that we want to hear in, in, in our la- our own language as to what's going on? Because if, the, the 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 house is burning. Hello, and what do you do? Because people like us haven't made the topics we're talking about interesting enough that news reporters believe that by covering it, their newspaper and their life will be better off. It has nothing to do with government. That um, Congresswoman Eshoo, since you mentioned her, she is very much in support of what we're doing tonight. We've actually contacted her office, and she she's in Washington, D.C. herself right now, but she had offered to write us a letter to just tell us how happy she is we're doing this and to be in support. So just wanted to let everyone know. So I was an entrepreneur, and and starting things. And we talk a lot, you know, government and politicians talk a lot about supporting small businesses here. And I don't know that, that what I would have been looking for support with was, you know, hey, fund my idea. Um, but there are, I think, other things. 
you know, that, that the government could have done, which would have made being a small business owner and an entrepreneur easier. And I think one of the, the simplest is, is one that's been very divisive in the last couple of years, national health care. You know, if my health care had not been tied to an employer, it, it would have been much easier to go out and be, uh, you know, an entrepreneur and to, to, to try some ideas. And, and so I think maybe there are some other issues like that that aren't directly tied to innovation, but could make it easier. Yeah, I on the healthcare thing, I wrote something that's probably still on my website, uh, and it was possible to conclude out of the framework anything from a fully non-government involved healthcare system to a fully government-run healthcare system. But one thing that did come out was employer-coupled healthcare, uh, limiting uh, your insurance providers and so forth made no sense whatsoever. So I think that one can decouple a couple of issues here. There's plenty of room for a better solution. Uh, a constant in it would be your health care, your health insurance is not tied to your employer, but there's plenty of room and a huge spectrum to figure out uh, what happens beyond that. Uh, with one of your comments, I would just be curious. I, I've been through the the campaign finance reform thing at a distance at least twice. I actually went to a meeting in, with Senator McCain and a bunch of business leaders while McCain-Feingold was still in the drafting arena. It was amazing to see the uh, intimacy with which Senator McCain knew some of these business leaders and their specific positions on nuances in what became McCain-Feingold. I went on the uh, condition I didn't have to say anything because I've never been able to figure out how to make something like that work. Right. And on the public financing side, I actually tagged along for a little while with an initiative here a few years ago, maybe it's still going, called California Clean Money or something like that. And I tried to point out uh, to the people leading that that there, I thought there were some serious flaws that made it uh, what they were proposing. Uh, not very good public policy in the hopes that they would figure out a way to fix it. I still have yet to find something that to me is, uh, shall we say, both satisfying and constitutional. <laughs> I, I would agree. I mean, I, I'm definitely not, as much as I, I do care about the issue a lot, I'm definitely not an expert by any means. Um, on the, uh, I know some folks that work with the Clean Money Campaign, but I, I agree. It's, there's. There are solutions out there, but I don't. You know, we obviously haven't found it yet because I, I think this is such a clarifying issue for folks that are invested in politics and invested in, in good governance. That if there was a good answer, that it would get support from all sides, from from Republicans and Democrats, and we would see some sort of grassroots movement around it. But I, um, I'm afraid that you're not getting a chance to like. Yes. To well, step what in. would you like me to? I, I have many thoughts. Okay. All answer, of answer me this one, Nikki. And and okay. <laughs> Isn't the biggest innovation in this election cycle the super PAC? Um, That's the biggest change. Yeah. What do you think? I think it's important to define what innovation is. <laughs> and I think what we're talking about is recognizing a problem and making it better. And whether or not something is an innovation needs to be determined by whether or not it made something better. Can you really call something innovative if you just change it and it doesn't lead to anything positive? Right. Uh -huh. Well, we can it's so. better for certain individuals, otherwise they wouldn't be putting their butts into it. Mm. So I guess I would Shout answer... Huh? Yeah, just, yeah, go ahead. I mean, I would answer your question with a way of framing a response that is satisfying for you. You would need to determine whether or not uh, the super PAC, what, 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 that, what problem that super PAC was trying to fix and whether or not it effectively did it. I don't know. I think the problem that they were trying to fix was certain rich individuals had a maximum amount that they can contribute to individual politicians, but they wanted to have more influence in the election, so they contribute more to the super PAC. And in that way, they have a bigger voice in the election. I wouldn't get, uh, I, I think there's an issue here. I wouldn't get too invested in it. In some sense, Americans are very creative, and you don't need a 
super PAC or whatever this is turned into to do whatever you're doing. If you want to do the same thing yourself, declare yourself a news media something or other, and you have complete freedom to say whatever you want to and to raise money from anybody. We don't need that construct to get that kind of result. Just ask so, Rush Limbaugh. So basically, um, while it is a topic of the moment, I think that uh, it's probably not the one to be focusing one's agony on. This, uh, go ahead if you were going to chat. I, no, I was going to. I was going to say it's not. It's not a matter of like simplifying. You don't want to simplify laws, right? Because the laws are complex because like each case is individual, and you need to have rules to tackle each individual problem that might come up in court. Right? That's like one of the luxuries that we have living in this country is that the laws aren't straight cut and dry it's so simple right there's not simple answers when you get to a courtroom right for any type of law right but the important part for being like a successful citizen in a society is being able to understand the laws that are being imposed upon you or that you agree to participate in when you're participating in society right so then it's not that a super PACs an innovation this year, right? The, the super PACs have been around. It's not they're not innovative at all, right? They've been around. It's just a matter of the fact that the populace is aware oh, yeah. of it. It's, it's new. Yeah. Well, then at the federal level, and the state level, you've had corporations giving as much as you want to candidates. Yeah. Yeah. But, but the, the idea that people are like, oh Take hey, well, oh, they are is truly new. Well, yeah, but I mean, the, but everything in that sense. Tax is were on super PACs, is the, yeah. yeah. But I mean, the idea that John Kerry was tanked by a super PAC. Yeah, the idea that the idea that like. Everyday citizens, like everyday voters, are now being communicated. Right? It's all about communication, right? Communicate what the rules really are that people are playing by, because it's it's not really fair if everyone thinks that you're playing touch football and it's like, oh, playing tackle. It's like, well, wait a minute, that's not fair. You know, it's not fair at all. And I have a couple of uh, couple of things for whatever they're worth. I'm not necessarily advocating them, but first of all, we've heard complaints that camp uh, candidates are even elected officials are spending all their time running around uh, trying to raise money, and it's detracting from their ability to spend time thinking about public policy. Uh, if you put two things together, uh, something like super PACs is an ideal solution because now maybe you can run for office and not have to raise very much of any money. So don't you know, don't balkanize the, the dialogue too much. And then just kind of off in another direction. I, I did a bunch of talks for visiting officials from, go, uh, government officials from China and on American governance and society. And, and they would make points about their view of how uh, donations to political candidacies has become a potentially corrupting influence in the United States. And I don't want to go yes or no on that question, but uh, you do want to also try to compare what's going on here to other places. For example, in this week, somewhere in this week in the Wall Street Journal, it was pointed out that the Politburo or something similar in China, maybe 70 people, uh, the average, and these are people who have obviously come up through the party system and maybe have had government posts, but basically they've been in the governance arena their entire lives or they wouldn't be there. Uh, the average wealth of uh, those 70 people is more than a billion dollars and in today's uh, arena. And so you might ask, how have they been able to amass that money? And what uh, form of, let's leave a blank there, <laughs> you want to compare between societies? I want to well, well, go ahead and then we'll... um, I just, I'd like to sort of kick, I'd like to kick the can back into the center of the circle here. Uh, again, trying to avoid boiling the ocean. Uh, but let me raise, uh, I said that, in my opinion, uh, politicians and our elected officials aren't really thinking much about innovation. But in fact, there, there is one area they are, and I'm going to direct this at, uh, at Tom. I'm going to let him take, take the heat for this, actually. And you'll see what my position on it is very rapidly. Um, you would think there was no policy, but in fact there is an un, there is an undisclosed policy, and the policy 
was elected, not uh, was uh, determined and made uh, popular, uh, not by a politician, uh, but one of our glorious New York Times writer called Mr. Friedman, who has an incredibly large audience. And he came up with this really swell idea. He says, well, we know, or something to that effect, and they wrote a book about it with his colleague, uh, from John Hopkins, a guy called Mandelbaum, who I met personally, and I bought his book for spite, by the way, because I'm going to find real <laughs> errors in it. And he said, well, all we got to do is we know that only the people who come from overseas, they're the ones that create the businesses and the jobs, and they're the ones. So therefore, uh, the minute somebody graduates um, uh, wherever, I suppose, in the world, uh, we'll locate them and we'll staple a green card and have them come here so that they can create, build a business and create jobs and so forth, as if it were that simple. And I'm thinking, well, wait a minute. Uh, I'm trying to put myself back in the position. If I were a mom or, or dad trying to get somebody through, um, I don't know, Carnegie Tech, maybe Stanford, or any other college in this country, I'm thinking, well, yeah, I think my kids have pretty smart why are they getting all the attention? And, they're, and they are coming back with all this debt they have to pay off, their, their scholarship uh, debt and loans and all the rest of it. But no, Friedman has did, done such a terrific job because he's a very powerful writer that he's managed to convince many folks there in uh, our, our federal capital that, yeah, that's really the way to go. I think there's a lot of flaws in that. Personally, I've met folks who uh, here uh, in the Valley who are manufacturers, and they say, we can do as well if given a chance, yeah. and we, will, we can create the jobs. <clears throat> and so here we have this... Uh, uh, yeah, great. This, is, this has gotten a lot of currency. It's been floated out there. I don't know if it's actually been put into any kind of legislation, but no one has, no one has uh, opposed it in any way. And I think it's, 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 it's insulting. Uh, if you look back at our history of Yankee ingenuity, uh, there's been a, a heck of a lot of that. And I certainly think uh, if, if you consider the jobs and, and the, the gates and all the way back to the inventors, uh, one of which uh, was responsible for my education, a guy called Peter Cooper. I went to the Cooper Union oh. uh, in New York. Uh, we have a tremendous history in this. So there's one where they got, they're doing it and they're going in, in, in opposite and in the wrong way. My opinion, I wanted to be sure that got on tape before before we ended up. So you're, you're, you're welcome to pick it up from there. I'm not sure what was directed at me that I would disagree Well, I was wondering whether you, this. I yeah. guess you have to Let's say start. whether you, 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 you heard of this, this thing being floated. Do you have any, yes, any I, responses? Yes, I've heard of it. Uh, to me, there's some significance in it, as there is in so many issues. I think I would rather be spending time encouraging people to discuss where do we want society to go, what's the role of government, and I would encourage some dimensions. I was very sensitive when I served uh, to my own debate and discussion with people around me about, uh, in fact, I came up with this sort of three roles for government. You'll probably find some more. But one is regulation, another is service, and another is advocacy or bully pulpit or whatever you want to say. And I think if you look throughout society, all three of those roles are very, very important uh, to me me, uh, government has gone overboard so far into service that there is no regulation meaningful within the government related to the service or that part of society that might actually need and use some meaningful regulation from government uh, that uh, we actually do have an opportunity maybe to look at government. I'd also look at this as a challenge in our society of, of to what extent do we think of things in terms of individuals and to what extent artificial groups and, and blocks that we attribute to the groups. There's plenty of way to, to, re, to start to reframe some of the dialogue and in doing so, some of the issues that come out invariably in a forum like this, your green card one and others, will have, I think, a lot better meaning and we could actually address them meaningfully and do something with them. Without them, they become uh, another in a long list of fixes that legislators and citizens just can't deal with. 
and uh, it's up to us, I think, uh, as individuals and uh, so forth, to try to restart the dialogue in this country, redirect it. Thank you, thank you. I did, although, you know, your, your statement was only tangentially related to politics, and it was more about innovation. And the thing that I picked up on was your frustration at manufacturing being abroad and this Krugman idea that's probably erroneous about how innovation comes from outside instead of inside. And um, I, uh, I actually was thinking about this paper coming out in management science. Um, on, on, are we, are we finished? We're good. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and it's not about politics. I'd like to share, but if it's too far off the beaten track, we can just take this offline. It's useful. Say something. All right. Um, so it's about a, you know what real options are? Anybody ever heard of real options? So it's, it's manufacturing. A lot of the reason that companies go abroad to manufacture, you know, electronics, like an iPhone, is because they have this idea that it saves money. And Wharton Business School, you know, says that you save money when you when you when you outsource. It's about 20% cheaper to make an iPhone in China than it is to make an iPhone here. Now, they have this idea it's because labor is cheaper, all of this all of this stuff. In actuality, that's false. And we don't buy that in the valley, although we ought to. There's a lot of money lost in not actually meeting demand well. There's always a line out the wazoo in the iPhone store when something new rolls out, you know, an iPhone 4. They run out. And then if your iPhone 4 runs out, what are you gonna do? You're gonna, you're gonna go to Samsung. Samsung and buy some sort of Samsung phone. Or you're, gonna, you're gonna buy a droid. Things are essentially substitutable. No. <laughs> <laughs> Potentially you're in the line. a bad example, but the lines are if, if, you, if you, you know, understand what I'm saying, yes. they're not meeting demand well. What can you do to, to, to still make more money if you're trying to make up for that 20% that it's cheaper to produce in China? Well, well meet demand. Well, 50% or 100% cheaper, mm -hmm. not 20%. Mm, uh, no. Uh, that's I would not encourage true. you to, I, I've seen people talk about this, the percentage of the cost of some of these devices that actually is in the labor and manufacturing is stunningly small, according to some studies, compared to public perception. Well, there's nobody in the United States making $1.78 an hour. Okay, but manufacturing, for manufacturing labor, is 25% of the cost. This is not the point. The point is, there's a lot of money that we're not making because we're not meeting demand well. And this is counterintuitive to what the Wharton Business School is saying, which is saying, you know, you, you cut your costs and then that's how you make a profit. We can bring manufacturing back here by paying higher labor costs by meeting demand better. Okay, so a lot of you shop at Costco, but I'm, I'm not married and I don't have like 10 kids that I have to deal with to you know, deal with. Well, I didn't mean to say that, you know, feed. And so it doesn't make sense for me to buy bulk. It makes sense instead for me to buy what I need. And there's a lot of unmet need that is being wasted by not meeting demand perfectly. And that's how we can bring manufacturing here. You want something, you pay a little bit extra to buy it when you, when you need it. There's a, really good, um, there's a really good article coming out, Management Science. It's about a Swiss cable company. The, the author is Suzanne de Treville. But it has some applications to you know bringing manufacturing back here and being innovative in our model. What you do is you cut down on your labor, but you have subcontractors you really, really, really trust. Those subcontractors manufacture in real time the amount of product that you need, and there's not all this waste. And so you, you know you end up making that 20% back and way more. Anyway, I, I, I didn't have a, I, there was no issue necessarily with manufacturing, although that it is uh, aspect of it. Now, uh, I think uh, my particular take on the subject that I brought up was the fact that. Um, uh, if we invested more or, or, or uh, paid more attention uh, to innovation in terms of encouraging our our youth, okay, to move in that direction, we, we wouldn't have to worry about, uh, well, we're just waiting for somebody to come overseas to build a factory here and make jobs. So that was that was basically my point. And, uh, yeah, there's, there's some fallacies in that as well, I, I, I realize. But uh, right now I think we just have to be a little bit more we have to tighten up and be a little bit more disciplined and, and, and all the rest of it. And what you were saying, by the way, in terms of the manufacturers, some manufacturers in, in uh, a couple of, in the San Jose area that uh, that, uh, that beat out beat out uh, the Chinese at their own 
game, and uh, we we haven't heard so much about them, and and uh, I've met one or two of them, and it's quite it's it's quite interesting. So it it, it can be done, and also. I think what you were already talking about was a, com a competitive advantage through innovation. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. you do that, yes, people are going to find that extra, you know, that that extra need to buy that product or to whatever. So, so to bring the politics back in, you know, Rick Santorum wants to reduce manufacturing tax to zero. So, how's that going to affect the U.S. economy? That's it. <laughs> That's the end? <laughs> Into the vacuum, I would just inject the standard comment, which is if I could see any coherent set of stuff that added up to a vision for where the country is going and placed some of these ideas in it in a way that uh, blanketed enough so that we might actually make some progress, um, I'd be much more enthused about it. Uh, I would challenge you actually to think about the following thing. If you listen to all the ideas that have been floated from all the candidates over some period of time, add them all up, <laughs> somehow figure out how to do all of it without going broke, would we be, and then throughout the part that you, you personally didn't like, you get to do that too, would we be much closer to where you'd want us to be compared to where we are or would be going anyway? Uh, I won't say anything further, but I think that's an interesting question to ponder. That's actually a really good point. That, you know, it's, it's, it might be a whole, it's another probably panel discussion, but how much the process of running changes the way you know we govern, changes the national dialogue. You know, uh, for you know, it's the most striking example, at least from my end of the political spectrum, is just recently uh, the shift. This sort of populist shift from Obama, sort of maybe re responding to the Wall, uh, the Wall Street movement, but also responding to you know political wins in the polls and and uh, where the where the Republicans were getting with their policies, their arguments, their their uh, their stances, and basically responding to that by saying, well, look, the pe majority of people are on this side, they're on that side, so I'm going to go with this side. And how much does that that sort of group think and that sort of uh, the the campaign itself determine how we get off track? You know. And before before they even get into office, there's guys you've made these promises, you've made these, you know, Obama spent the first three years of his administration being the the great uniter and the great you know olive branch extender when he knew for a fact, and it was obvious, and it was said in the papers every day and on the news every day that the other side didn't want to work with him at all. So why keep doing it? Well, it's because he ran on that. That's he was obeying his own idiom basically. So how much does that actually affect? Um, the way we govern, or should, should these guys really just talk about what they really want to do, as opposed to how, you know, the, the tiny differences between their their health one healthcare policy and the other healthcare policy, or their one tax policy and the other tax policy, really thinking about the bigger, going back to the bigger issues, you know, and the and the, yeah. the things we all agree on. Seth, you asked us a question a while ago that we promptly ignored, but that I <laughs> that I wanted to address. You you asked about you know different ways that we achieve political outcomes and innovations in the ways that we achieve political outcomes. And I think, you know, you wanted us to potentially touch on the Occupy movement, right? Yeah. So, you know, the Occupy movement failed. It, it was a grassroots movement, and they had some interesting points and ideas about equality as opposed to just freedom. Freedom to make choices and then, you know, letting the market decide how successful you are. But it failed. And it failed largely because there's no cohesiveness. There was no leadership. And it's interesting because something very similar is happening in Russia right now, right? Anti-Putin. And so we can think of, it's not just innovation in American politics, it's innovation in politics. It's grassroots. It's how do you have successful grassroots and why do you have grassroots epically fail? Um, and I think it comes down to you have to have some cohesion. You have to have some leadership, even if there's popular support and movement. So if the anti-Putin thing is going to be successful at all, there needs to be somebody rising up to be an organizer, but not, not necessarily like big boss in charge person, but just somebody to have a cohesive voice. I think that's, that was a potential innovation that could have been in American politics. The Occupy movement was an attempt to have the people have a direct say. 
it failed because there was no vision and leadership, um, but that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. So, I don't know. I would, I would actually push back a little bit on that. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I, think, me too. <laughs> I don't think that it's, fa I, I mean, in, in that, you know, tents cropping up in Zuccotti Park or in front of actually San Jose City Hall had its own little Occupy movement, which is very clean. They had their own little cigarette jar even, so they kept all the butts in one place. Um, but as far as idea, you know, I, just, I think I touched on this just a minute ago, you know, whether or not the Democrats and Obama took up this sort of populist mentality because it's the way things were going, it's the, and it's the way they, what they really wanted to do, they've wanted to do for the last four years, they just haven't been able to because they've been stuck by the, or constrained by, you know, the actual, gov actually governing. Uh, they've changed the dialogue. They definitely have changed the national dialogue. We're talking about income inequality at, on a regular basis more often than just about any other subject now. Yeah, and New it's... English. even. Well, even to well, even to the point that you know that yeah, we're forcing a Republican primary, which which generally, honestly, are focused on issues like Santorum is raising about Satan and about Jesus and about you know, values, and it's forcing them to respond, and it's it's actually making Mitt Romney less desirable in general. I think even to Republicans because he is seen as so distanced from that idea, and he's seen as the one percent. We hear about this all the time. So in in that way, they have I think they have succeeded in terms of changing the dialogue. I do agree with you though that the very principles that they ground themselves in are detrimental to them, to that movement as Occupy moving forward. I completely agree with that. But as far as the, di the national dialogue, I think they've succeeded in changing that, whether they intended to or not, whether they intended for this to happen or not, or if they re really, from my perspective, the Occupy folks really wanted their own country. They wanted their own country in these parks. You know, or the, maybe it was originally they, they wanted something out of their democracy and folks who were all out there everywhere, the anarchists, saw an opportunity, came in like they did in Oakland, which is probably the worst example of the <laughs> Occupy movement, and took it over and made it about something else and made it about, you know, we don't want leaders, we don't want to move anywhere, we want, you know, we just want, it, we want what we want, you know, and that's it. And this is our little corner of the world. It's like that little hole at Berkeley, that little, I don't know if you've ever been to uh, Sproul Plaza at Berkeley. This little hole that's marked as, you know, this is free land. This is this is not part of the universe. You know, that's pretty much what they wanted. You know, um, and it's, it just can't exist. If there, you can't have both. You either are a part of this society and this government and working to change it, or you just you do leave. I mean, you just you you know, and if if you're really that frustrated with, it, if you want your own country, make your own country. But this is the country you've got. So I so I agree with you. And at the same time, I think that they have even inadvertently move the needle a little uh, at least a little bit. Now, whether or not it swings back, you know, whether or not that's sustainable, we'll see. We'll definitely see. Well, but potentially, the, the, the point here is just to raise it as a, as a topic of innovation in American correct. politics. Correct. This is an innovative way and, you know, sure, you know. It was innovative. Very much so. Right. And, the use, and the use of social media, you know, the Arab Spring, it, it all has, it all ties in, I think, together. And there are successful and there are unsuccessful versions I'll tell you of that. What I think the innovation was, and this is from a project that I've working, been working on. I mean, Time Magazine named the protester Person of the Year in 2011, and when they did, they wrote about. Um, you know, the fact that social media played a role in this, but it didn't cause this. Uh, and they, they talked about the breakdown of traditional leadership, and they said the reason we didn't choose an individual is because leadership hasn't come from the top of the pyramid, it's come from the bottom. Uh, and to invoke Thomas Friedman, he said something similar on, on Meet the Press on Christmas Day. He said, you know, we're seeing the democratization of information. Everybody's now a broadcaster. So we're seeing the democratization of uh, innovation. You know, small groups can now take on large corporations. And he said, most of all, we're seeing the democratization of um, expectations that everybody, whether you're in Tahir Square or India or Israel or, or Wall Street, thinks that they're entitled to the same rights and participation and justice. And he also said, you know, we are seeing leadership come from the bottom, not from the top. Uh, and I think that that's been a huge innovation that, that has come not only from Occupy, but from Tahir Square and, and from a lot of places. So. I think one thing that's really important to remember, and this is something I touched on with any potential client or anyone I'm trying to get, any even individual or friend that I'm trying to get in, into social media, we still don't know the potential of it. We don't know what it's going to be like in two or three years, even. It's, it, things are changing that quickly. I mean, for, uh, not for, but Facebook was something for the, the Harvard dorms, you know, seven years ago. Right, and even five years ago, I wasn't on Foursquare or, or Facebook. If I'm saying Foursquare, like, because I'm on Foursquare now, you know, even six months ago I was on Foursquare. Now I'm mayor of five different places on Foursquare. You know, how'd that happen? We're still learning how to use this, and 
as we continue moving on, I think we're going to find more and more innovative ways to use. And when people are just, it's, it's amazing what you can do. Like, that's, this is why I think participation is important, regardless of the expertise that you have in power, because you, there's nothing that can't be solved, I think, by putting 300 million people together in a, you know, uh, in, in a, you can't put them in a room together, but you can certainly put ideas out there that they can vote on, that they can support, that they can add to and subtract from. I'd, I'd add to that, um, kind of leading off this point is that, um, I don't know if you guys remember, see how fuzzy I can get here, um, but, um, all right, any of you guys, um, any of you guys experienced the, the internet blackout day, where, like, Google was blacked out and Wikipedia was blacked out, and it's like, that was a combination of, like, social media, like, first it started bubbling up, and people, you know, these companies started talking to each other, and they realized, okay, you know, this is so something we can all get on board with, and it was a cohesive action, and, like, you know, one day or something, there was, like, six million signatures, like, raised and sent to the White House, like, that's just, like, insane. You know, that's never been possible before. How you couldn't raise a million, six million signatures in. I mean, that's you know. a great example, and it's happening over. You know, I mean, you saw it with the with the debit card fees with Bank of America and Wells Fargo. Mm -hmm. You saw it with Verizon when they tried to do a fee to pay online bills. You're seeing it with Rush Limbaugh right now. I mean, the the ability of the masses to influence major corporations in a very short period of time is huge right now. Yeah. Consumers have the power right now. I mean, really, this, I, I, another thing I tell folks is, you know, if you're a business and you can't reach all of your clients, all your customers within an hour, you know, without getting on the phones and, like, doing a massive phone bank with everyone or, or sending out a hard copy letter, if you can't do that, even just with an email, you're in trouble. Because the minute that a bad story breaks about you, the minute someone finds a finger in your chili, you know, that you, they own the news owns that story. You don't own that story, right. you know. And Wendy's would have been great, greatly served if they could have reached out to every single person in their network, you know, through a few million people on Facebook, and said, you know, "This is a hoax," right away, you know, been able to get that message out. And said it was buried on page thirteen, and the finger in the chili story was page one for three days, you know. So um, we we have all the power. I read a, a stat there that it really intrigued me: is that uh, you, the average American consumer. Uh, buys into, I forget the exact percentage, but it's you know, less than 5% of advertising that they see. But if, if you get something shared with you on Facebook, a friend recommends a movie to you or a product, 75% of the time you're, you're going to follow their recommendation. You're going to believe that recommendation and trust it. And that is just incredibly important when you talk about you know these traditional ways of that people used to advertise and to get consumers to buy into things. There's a whole different world now where they can't, it's almost like they can't even control it. You know, the, the companies, organizations, politicians have to figure out how to influence the influencers, how to influence us to tell our friends, as opposed to not influencing us to buy something, influencing us to buy something and then tell our friends how great it is, you know? That's the real power. So we really have all the control at this point. It's a question of just utilizing it. And I think we're, we're, we're coming into our own. It's really like a, a, a nascent stage right now. And I think it, we're taking baby steps towards it. And I'm really hopeful for the future and when we can hopefully learn to harness this in a greater way. But I think we're still learning at this point. And I think we're still learning democracy, really. I mean, we've only had American democracy for what, 200, or American Republican democracy for 220, 230 years. You know, there's a lot, there's a lot to go. It's still one little dot in the history of even humanity, let alone the Earth. So I think we've, we've got a long way to go. And hopefully we don't kill the Earth before, or kill our chances to live on the Earth before we get. So, so a point for people to ponder to the extent you go with Peter on the consumer power thing is uh, to what extent and how fast might that translate into governance power.